Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. I know that you have a lot of excellent choices. Indeed, if I were not here, I would be in some of these other talks as well. So I appreciate that you chose uh, to spend your time here in this morning uh, with little old me. Uh, now, guards, lock the doors. Lock the doors. Bar the doors. We want to make sure that everybody is sat where they're supposed to be. Um, we're going to go through a lot of stuff. I just realized all of like a minute ago uh, that this is supposed to be, in theory, a 45-minute talk, but it's not a 45-minute talk. So you know, hold on tight. <laughs> we're going to go a little faster than we, uh, we might have otherwise had to go, all right? Um, we're going to go through a lot of stuff, and the goal, as usual, isn't so much to, to, uh, to uh, understand individual things that I'm doing. It's to appreciate what's possible. Uh, uh, and as, as such, I put up the code there. Uh, it's online. It's your own reference and edification uh, for later on. It's a Git repository that contains all the code that you're going to need to be able to understand everything we're going to talk about today. And if you should have questions, I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, via Twitter, for example, it's 2018. How many of you using? How many of you using Twitter? I'm just curious. Twitter, Twitter, 2018. All right, the rest of you, uh, get on it. Come on, it's a great place to be. It's the new IRC. It's where the developers that drive the open source that power your business are. And if you want to engage, you owe yourself to be there. Uh, what about email? Is anybody here using email? Email? Anybody? Email? E email? No. Very good. Okay, moving on. We're in a post Slack world, people. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means, but it's a thing people are saying. So, uh, email. I don't have a fax machine either, so it's fine. Whatever. If you want to reach out to me there, do, please. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team. I'm an open source engineer and contributor. I have the dubious distinction of being the number one, the most prolific, the most highly lauded, most visible, most acclaimed contributor <clears throat> of, um, uh, of bugs, but still number one, number one, number one across all the projects to which I've been a contributor and committer uh, for the last, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 plus years, okay? Uh, I am also a uh, book author and a training video leader and so on. So I've done all sorts of, uh, you know, instructional things as in my capacity as a Spring Developer Advocate and a Java champion. I finished uh, some videos. I've got videos on applied continuous delivery. I've got videos on Cloud Foundry and microservices with Spring and REST APIs and all these sorts of things on uh, the uh, Safari Online Marketplace uh, from the Live Lesson series. I also just finished my fifth book. My fifth book, it's called Cloud native Java. And this book is all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud. It's all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud in terms of Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and Cloud Foundry. These are open source technologies that are designed to allow you to build applications faster. And this book took uh, a little longer than I thought it would. It wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't as agile as we'd hoped, if I'm honest. It took a little longer. We, we should have known better. We should have known better. We, we know that uh, software engineers are notoriously uh, not great at estimation. So uh, we thought six months roughly in and out we'll be done with the book and then we'll, uh, we'll be off to the races and we can enjoy our lives. Uh, but it took out, it, it took out, uh, turned out it took, a, it took a little longer. It took a little longer than, than six months. It took, it took a little, just a little, it took 18 months longer uh, than, than six months. It was, uh, it was a little longer than we expected. And there's a lot of back and forth that went on behind, behind the scenes. And I want to explain that to you. I, I don't want to air out my dirty laundry, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. O'Reilly and uh, we, the authors, we had some trouble. We had some trouble. You see, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of deliberation that went on in choosing the animal on the cover. Anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it doesn't all that much matter what's in the book proper. It has everything to do with the animal on the cover. So we eventually settled after 18 months of deliberation, back and forth, back and forth, uh, on this blue-eared kingfisher. A blue-eared. It's a bird with ears. Have you ever seen a bird with ears? They look very silly. Anyway, it's a bird with blue ears, and it's called the kingfisher. It's from the Indonesian Java Islands. And it's a bird. And birds fly, yes, through the clouds. So it's a bird that is native to Java that flies through the clouds. It's a cloud-native Java bird. It's a bird. Never mind. It'll come. Give, give it time. Give it time. There's that, right? Uh, and, of course, I should mention that we're hiring at Pivotal, right? Uh, we have lots of open positions. If you're at all interested in working in the open source and fighting the good fight, we'd, uh, we'd love to have you. It's not really a fight. and Nobody has to, nobody has to get hurt, by the way. It's just a metaphor. Uh, but please, join us. Uh, and also, I work at Pivotal, which is nice for me, and uh, we have a lot of great open source software at Pivotal. We care about the open source software at Pivotal. It, it is a big part of what we're doing, but let's be very clear. At the end of the day, it's not the main reason we're here. It's not the reason that people like myself <coughs> spring out of bed. You see, what we care about First and foremost, above all else, is helping people build better software faster. Moving an idea from concept to customer, from 
idea to inception all the way up to production. We want to see that cycle reduced as quickly as possible. Uh, and we want to see people do so safely, right? It's Anybody can get in a Ferrari and go, uh, you know, as fast as possible. That's not necessarily safe, though, right? So we, we uh, see that a lot of organizations struggle with this. They know they need to go faster, but they struggle because they have these uh, large existing monolithic applications. These applications are a good problem to have. Most of these companies are uh, victims of their own success. The software was written in yesteryear, before the era of cloud computing, before the economics of cloud computing, and as such, uh, it represents a, a bit of a burden these days. It takes a long time to affect any change in this large, unyielding, sort of burdensome code base. And the reason, I think, for that has to do with the size of the team that eventually has to scale out to accommodate that code base. It's easy to say, oh, well, you're a startup, uh, and these startups are small, and thus they're able to succeed, they're able to iterate quickly, and say that it's impossible at scale. That's just not true. That ignores the success of companies like Netflix and Amazon and, and Twitter and all these other massive engineering groups that still succeed, still iterate quickly and, uh, you know, uh, safely. So the question is, what is the important thing here? What is the thing, what is this, the key to their success? And there's no one thing, certainly, but I think a lot of it has to do with the size of the teams working on the code base. You see, in having small teams, you deliver software as though you are a startup, even if you have to work with, at some point, other teams. Now, this is a, a fairly non-controversial thing. I mean, this is not new, right? We, uh, we have Conway's Law. I'm sure we're all sick to death of hearing about Conway's Law. But it, it's this insight that Mel Conway had in the 1970s that says that software is a mirror image of the communication patterns of the organization that builds it, right? So if your organization is dysfunctional, that'll be reflected in the software necessarily uh, that that organization builds. Put another way, crap in, crap out. If you want to fix the software, you fix the dysfunctional organization. It's not a new in, uh, insight at all, but it does you know, pro pro provide a path forward. It does prescribe something that we can use to sort of improve our uh, systems, our code. We can make small, make uh, concise the, the teams that work on that code. The question, of course, is how do you do that, right? You can't just take a large application and arbitrarily break it apart. So we look for these large, we look at these large existing applications and we look for seams along which to decompose them. We turn to Eric Evans. Eric Evans wrote a great book called Domain Driven Design. How many of you have read that book? It's a, an absolutely amazing tome. Keep it under the pillow. Read it to your kids. It's amazing. And this book, uh, you know, talks about a number of things. One of which is called this, uh, called a bounded context. Uh, a bounded context is a part of the domain model that stands unto itself, internally consistent and reusable. It's a part of the domain that uh, needs no other part of the system to do its work. And if you can identify these bounded contexts, and I grant you it's a bit of an art form at some point, but if you can identify these bounded contexts, you have a natural candidate for this decomposition. You can decompose your application along the seams of this context, and that forms uh, a natural place to do what we're trying to do, this, this uh, extraction, this decomposition. We have a natural candidate for a small, singly focused, independently deployable, reusable, bounded context. I said independently deployable. That's important because we don't want to have to be gated by other parts of the organization whenever we want to make a change to our code base, right? If I have to wait for other people to finish their code before I can deploy mine, then I may as well not decompose at all. There's no point in that. So it has to be independently deployable. And when we talk about independently deployable, necessarily we're implying distribution, really, especially in the JVM. There's, there's some technologies that purport to give you sort of isolation and individual loadability, you know, pluggability and that kind of thing on the JVM, but they really don't work in practice. So really we're talking about separate processes, talking to each other over the network. And that distribution invites complexity. So today we're going to talk about ways to approach that complexity. There's uh, patterns and uh, primitives that we need to be aware of in order to make that journey to, pr to production uh, fun. And in order to understand that, uh, we have to understand that we're building a distributed system. And when you build a distributed system, you run headlong into a number of, uh, of pains. You run in headlong into a number of pains that you need to address before you can go any further. The first big pain is how quickly can you stand up a production-worthy service? How quickly from 0 to 60, or uh, what is the equivalent, 120 kilometers, I guess, uh, how quickly from, from 0 to whatever your speed limit is? And this, in Germany, that metaphor doesn't work at all because the Autobahn has no speed limit. So... Uh, how quickly can you, from whatever your, from zero to whatever your speed limit is, stand up a single production-worthy service? Suppose you had to build a service that s simply emitted the message, hello world. What all would you have to do to be able to deploy that into a production environment? Security, observability, monitoring, load balancing, heartbeat detection, infrastructure, rack and stack servers, virtual machines, containers, all of that. Everything you have to do that I am sure nobody relishes doing. I'm sure that with the rarest of, ex of exceptions, that it no, that Nowhere in your uh, mission statement, in the placard, in the lobby of your headquarters, does it say, we're here to s solve SSL, right? 
Nobody says that. They said, we're here to solve whatever our business vertical is. We, that's what we care about. And yet we need to confront these other sort of realities of building something for production. The other, once we've gotten past all that, once we've gotten past those complexities, now we're confronted with the, uh, the, uh, the complexities of building a distributed system. We now face a proliferation of different services talking to each other, and we face the realities of distribution, right, and the possible fallacies of distribution uh, that we have to be aware of, that we have to uh, make sure we don't run afoul of. So when we do that, uh, we need to be able to, you know, handle things like outages and, and fault tolerance and so on. So today we're going to talk about uh, uh, building cloud-native software. Uh, for a cloud-native application these days is, uh, as I, at least as I define it, something that is agile, something that you can iterate quickly. It is something that is observable, that is to say it's fault-tolerant and, and uh, you know, resistant to uh, topology changes and outages. It's elastic. It takes advantage of the elastic, cloudy nature uh, of, of modern platforms today. And, of course, it is observable, both at the individual service level and the distributed systems level, the systemic level, the, the whole system level, right? So today we're going to talk about a number of different technologies uh, to support all of that. Uh, those are my slides. I hope you like them. I worked hard on those. Uh, what would you think? Yes? No? Maybe? Best slides you've seen this hour? Good. Good. Okay. Wrong one. Opening this up. All right. So we're going to start here at start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the Internet. My first favorite place on the Internet, of course, is production. I love production, and you should love production, too. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on Earth. But if you haven't gone to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If you want for inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start.spring.io. If your children are restless and can't sleep, Start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of alcohol abuse and websphere and PHP, start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a new piece of software today, a new service, something with which to have an example, something with which to iterate. So I'm going to build something called the reservation service. And we're going to build a, uh, a service that uh, has a reactive web uh, application, it's a reactive web application. Uh, it's going to su support reactive principles here, and we'll, um, I suppose we could spend a whole talk on that, but suffice it to say, reactive programming describes a computational paradigm that allows us to model asynchronous I.O., right? So we get to write code that is aware of the fact that eventually, somewhere in the stack, we're going to delegate the input and output of uh, I.O. to the operating system instead of uh, blocking in a thread and maintaining or monopolizing that thread uh, inefficiently, right? Uh, so we're going to use we're going to use a number of different technologies here. We're going to use the reactive web support. Uh, we need some sort of persistence technology. I could have chosen reactive Cassandra, reactive Redis, reactive Couchbase, for example. Uh, but I, I chose uh, MongoDB. I chose reactive MongoDB because when you want to lose your data and you want to lose it reactively, there is nothing better than reactive MongoDB. Okay. I'm going to use Actuator for observability and operational concerns. I'm going to use the config client for centralized configuration. I'll use Eureka for service registration and discovery. I'll use Zipkin for distributed tracing. Uh, and I'll use Lumbach, which is a, a compile time annotation processor that'll make uh, the tedium of Java just that much more bearable. Okay, my friend? So now we have a number of different selections here. I think I'm happy with these selections, but that said, if I were so inclined, I could click on switch to the full version, where I'll be given a veritable ocean of checkboxes, things that I could, were I so inclined, add uh, to my build, to my application. Uh, but for now, for, for this uh, demo, for, for today, it suffices to leave things as they are. That said, I encourage you to peruse this list at your own leisure later on. There's a number of great choices here. All right, so I'm going to hit generate, and that'll give us a new project uh, that we're going to open up in our ID. And I've downloaded this into my downloads directory, uh, maybe, Wi-Fi permitting, there we are. Uh, and I'm going to open this up in my IDE. I'm going to use IntelliJ. How many of you are using IntelliJ? I'm just curious. Good stuff, hot sauce. What about Eclipse? Right on, awesome. I love Eclipse. What about NetBeans? Well, it's awesome as well. I love NetBeans. What about Emacs? Are you here, sir? Where's the Emacs guy? It doesn't seem to matter which... There he is. That's every single city... That's, you're not him. Every single city, country, and continent I go to, it's the same guy. Same one. One human being. One object identity. I say, who uses Emacs? He says, I do. And then he leaves. Presumably to troll again at the next location. Are you related? Maybe. It's the same human. So anyway, we have this... Uh, we have this new build, we have this new project, and I'm going to go ahead and comment out some of the builds, bits that I don't need just yet. So let me open up this uh, Maven build, and I'm going to comment this out. We'll say, uh, Spring Boot Starter, uh, we want all that. We don't want the config and the uh, Eureka and the Zipkin. We'll comment that out for now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a new application that manages data. It's going to manage data in, Spring, in MongoDB, and it's going to be a data 
It's going to be an object that I'm going to describe using this. Uh, uh, it's going to be a record that I'm going to uh, describe using this type called a reservation. And I'm going to use Spring Data's mapping abilities, or ORM facilities, to turn this into a document. All right. And I'm going to say private string ID. And I'll use a, I'll have a field here, private string reservation name. And I'll say at ID. And there we are. There's my basic entity. That's the essence of what I'm trying to express. But of course, this is Java, so it's not nearly enough. I need getters, setters, two string equals, all that kind of nonsense. So I'm going to say no args constructor, all args constructor, and at data. These are compile time annotations that at compile time will result in getters and setters and all these sorts of things being added to the type. It's thanks to that Lumbach project, right? So reservation equals new reservation. You can see it has a constructor. I can say reservation dot, uh, reservation dot set ID get ID, all that kind of stuff, right? So it makes it easier for me to get work done now. What I want to do is I want to save data into the database. So I'm going to create a repository, an object that's meant to persist records into the database. And here I'm going to use the reactive Mongo repository. This is an interface that prescribes basic functionality. It provides basic functionality uh, that, uh, you know, supports common use cases like creation, reading, updating, deleting, finding, paging, sorting, all these sorts of things that I want to be able to work with, uh, you know, this basic types. Now you'll see here that it supports monos and fluxes. These two types are publishers. These are reactive streams publishers that will emit items of data. And I can subscribe to the emission of those data, uh, of those records. I don't need to wait there, sit there and block waiting for the next byte or record or whatever, right? This is a way of modeling code that will uh, provide data or produce data that I can work with later on when it's available, but I don't have to sit and block in the meantime, right? This is what I meant by a computational metaphor for asynchronous code. They're both publishers. They just have different semantics. Now, I want to be able to use this repository in Spring to write some data into the database. So I'm going to create an object that uh, that is a callback here. Right? It's a callback interface. And it's a it's a bean. It's just a regular Spring class. It's got annotated with that component. And when Spring sees this application runner, it's going to call this void run method, giving me a chance to uh, to write some data to the database. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and add to this con to the constructor. I'll inject it in the constructor. And here I'm going to write some data to the database. We'll use some names. My name is uh, Josh. It's so lovely to meet you. Uh, what about you, buddy? What is your name? What is it? How do you spell that, my friend? E-E? -E? Like that? Very good. Nice to meet you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, what about you, miss? What is your name? Miss. How do you spell that, my friend? R-W... Okay. E, R W E E J. Oh, A. Like that? Very good. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry I, I butchered that. I didn't mean to. Uh, uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? How do you spell that, my friend? Like, like so? Yeah, like so? Very good. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Uh, that's four. We need eight. Eight is nice because I can divide it by two and then two again and still two. Makes it easier for me to sleep at night. So let's see. What about you, buddy? What's your name? How do you spell that? T Y A? Whoops, like that? Very cool. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about what about you, Miss? The related to my Emacs guy. What is D E N I S? Like so? Very good. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about you, buddy? What, what's your name? Yeah, sure. How do you spell that? N D A. Like that? What what, what is it? Oh, okay. So two N. Hey, oh, very good. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to screw that up. Very nice to meet you. Uh, who wants to be my last victim? I'm sorry, I mean, I mean volunteer. Who wants to be my last volunteer? Uh, what about you, buddy? How do you spell that, my friend? Like that? Very cool. Nice to meet you. So there we are. We have a, a publisher full of names. And I want to take each one of those names and I want to write it to the database. I'm going to turn it into a new reservation. I'm going to say for each name, let's turn it into a reservation object here, a, a type that I'm going to persist in the database, like so. And then for each one of those, I want to take it and I want to turn it into a uh, record that's been saved into the database. So if you look at what I'm doing, I'm staging this data together here, right? Um, reservations, there we are. Uh, and I'm going to persist it. Now I'm going to say reservation dot, uh, map, uh, reservation. This is an, a reservation object now. I'm going to take each one of those and save it into the database. So I'll say this dot reservation repository dot save, passing in uh, the reservation itself, right? Now, this uh, would seem to work. It looks like it's going to do the right thing, but what do you think this is going to result in? It's going to give me a publisher full of publishers, right? Because the save output of this is a publisher in of itself. So I'm going to actually unpack each intermediate publisher using flat map, right? And the result is now I can type this to a reservation of a publisher of reservations, and uh, then I want to save each one. I've already done that. Now, what if I run this code? What do you think is going to happen? 
Exactly. Nothing. Right? This is, this is lazy, quite like myself. It has to be executed. You have to trigger its execution. And so you can do that by saying map.subscribe. That's one way to do it. That's the way you're supposed to do it, right? You're supposed to say to, to the publisher, I'm interested in subscribing, and only then will it start activating. So this is certainly one option. Another option is to use a uh, block. You can block. But don't do that. I showed this to my, to, my, to my partner. I said, sweetheart, darling, love of my life, what do you think of this code? And she looked at me like she had made a terrible, terrible mistake in choosing me. She knew that this is not how you write this code. She is much uh, better at this than I am. She said, no, 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 you, why would you take this nice reactive API and then block? You've lost the benefits all, all together. So don't do that. Instead, compose or subscribe. So this is one option. I want to I wanna go ahead and uh, uh, run that code, but I'll, and I can subscribe. But I want to do some other stuff first. How many of you know the expression, a broken clock strikes true twice a day? It means by virtue of the fact that the hands on the clock are fixed and they're not moving, that it is correct at least twice a day, right? It's correct in the morning and correct in the evening. Uh, this expression reminds me of MongoDB. You see, not often, but sometimes MongoDB will persist your data. Most of the time, it will lose it reliably, guaranteed. But sometimes bugs creep in and it will sometimes persist it. I can't fix that, and I know the team works hard. I don't mean to pick on them. They want to lose it 100% of the time, and they try very hard but sometimes data gets persisted. So I want to delete all the data in the database, like that, and then subscribe, which is a little weird. Uh, and then I want to say uh, this dot reservation repository dot find all, and I'll subscribe to that as well, right? So this is, these are four different lines, four different sets of things, or three different sets of things. This works, I suppose, but one thing to understand is that this is not necessarily going to complete before this does. And this code word here won't, it won't complete necessarily before this does. There's, these things are executing concurrently, right? So I need to use the API. I need to compose. I say, then many, and it's expecting another publisher, another type of publisher, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it a publisher by, you know, removing these intermediate variables that, while educational, uh, only complicate our code here. So there we go. There's our new publisher. I'll pass that in here. And then I will compose again. I will say, using this repository, there we are, okay? So there's the the updated code, I'm now using this very, very sort of succinct API to stage operations, each of which returns a publisher, and I can compose them, uh, you know, in a chain like this, right? Each line has its own chain. Now, when I run this code, let's see what we get. Let's see what happens. When this application starts up, it's going to call the run method. I'll get some data in the database, and uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Did I run MongoDB? Yeah, I've got run MongoDB. So that didn't... Uh, Oh, we didn't print anything out, so we need to confirm that everything is working as we expect it by, uh, by running it, okay? Okay, here we are. All right, very good. Look at that. There we are. We happy few. It worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. What were you expecting? Instead, what I wanted to talk to you about was this. This is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. This ASCII artwork took a long time to get right, but you see, we on the Spring team have many people who are doctors, PhDs. People in their previous lives worked in nuclear physics, star stuff. The very celestial bodies in the heavens above us were their daily bread and butter. So it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue that said, darn it, we need good ASCII artwork. And I think you'll agree they did a great job. So it's for this reason that I want to take a brief digression, just an ever so brief digression, to talk about what I consider to be a glaring and serious deficiency in IntelliJ JetBrains product. For while I'm a fan, I consider this to be particularly short-sighted. You see that checkbox? What the heck? It says hide banner. That's a dumb feature. Once clicked, it suppresses the output of the ASCII artwork. Who does this? So I can sense your outrage, and I, too, was also outraged. I did what all of us, any of us, would have done in that same position. I went on the Internet, and I cried. And I sent a message out onto the Twitters. And uh, my friend, Jan Sabron, Jan Sabron is a, uh, here's, here's, here he is right here. Oh, where is that? Come on. Uh, this, this, he's a, he's a, he's a, come on. Come on. There you go. You can see he is a software developer by passion at IntelliJ Idea JetBrains, right? And he sent me this message of hope, which I share here with you today, right now. Don't worry, my friends. Hope springs eternal. Anyway, we have now great ASCII artwork. We have data in the database. We need a REST API, right? So here I'm going to build a, uh, a functional reactive REST endpoint. I'll say at bean, and I'll use this uh, 
you know, functional reactive style here. So I'll say server uh, response res routes return router functions dot re route request predicates dot get. And I'm going to say whenever somebody calls the reservations, it should be get on the local host and goes to reservations. It'll return a new server response. Uh, sorry, new H, uh, new handler function that uh, is typed to server response. Okay, and there I'm going to return server response that okay, and I'm going to return the data that comes from using this repository to look up the data. I'm going to inject that there uh, and then return find all uh, with a payload type reservation. Okay, now uh, let's see. Oh, I need to do body instead. So there we are. There's my my uh, anonymous little web controller, REST controller. I can use Java isms to make this a little bit. Uh, Cleaner. I can use static imports, for example. There we go. I can use lambdas. That cleans up nicely there. Turn that into a request, and there we go. There's my one-liner for a request for a reservations endpoint that will functionally handle the data uh, when somebody calls. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and restart the application, and we have now a web application, a REST service at localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. Et voila. Okay. Very good. Now. Are we ready to go to production yet? No, of course not. Not just yet. We have concerns like security and observability and these non-functional requirements that gate our ability to move to production. Uh, these are the things that most organizations have uh, and they need to address, but they don't really think about. But we all have them. Um, most organizations I've talked to, not yours, of course. Not yours. Definitely not yours. But most organizations that I've talked to have this dreaded wiki page. And again, I know it couldn't be, it couldn't be yours. Most organizations have this dreaded wiki page with 500 easy steps to production. It is the list of things that you need to do before you can deliver line one of business differentiating functionality. And in this case, one of those things is observability. We need to support remediation. We, the way we do that is by supporting visibility into what the application is doing. So here, I have this library called Actuator. And Actuator, uh, will, so, will, it'll expose uh, endpoints that surface information about uh, the application itself. And so these are operational endpoints that are designed to support observability and to promote operationalizing the application. Endpoints that uh, are standardized across all of our services. This was inspired by the Google Borg paper, right? They talked about how their Borg monitoring requires that all services, no matter what the nature of the service, stand up these standardized HTTP endpoints. So I've got the application now running. I go to localhost 8080 forward slash reservations, and now I go to actuator, and I can see a number of different endpoints here. Beans, uh, the health, the health check, right? The health check shows me the file system and the MongoDB connection. Uh, it shows me, um, you know, the environment, the properties in the environment, for example, that are uh, available to this JVM process, the info endpoint, the loggers that have been configured. I can download a thread dump or a heap dump. I can get, see all the metrics. These metrics are keys and values. You can emit custom keys and values, and these, these can be synchronized with uh, two time, time series databases like InfluxDB or Prometheus or whatever to support operationalizing your application observability, right? You need to, uh, to, to see trends over time. So all these things are there, and that makes it so that we can now kind of get a feeling for what the application is doing. If you're using a platform like Cloud Foundry, it'll show all of these things in an aggregate single pane of glass. That gives you a, a single picture to look at to understand what the state of your system is. Now, we've got that, and we could easily add security. Are we, are we ready to go to production? Sure. Why not, right? So let's go ahead and uh, build an application. Um, uh, we've got an application. Let's go ahead and talk about what happens if we have more of these things, right? If we proliferate more services. We're going to run into limitations uh, around some of the things that we need to support. One thing that becomes tedious in a distributed system is configuration. Thus far, I've showed you how to configure things using this property file. That's fine if I want to have to recompile my jar, but I want to be able to centralize my configuration. I want to be able to support symmetric encryption and decryption of uh, sensitive values in a property file. I want to be able to support live reconfiguration of things in the property files. And I also want to be able to support auditing and journaling. I want to see who changed what and when, if necessary, to roll that configuration back. So for these reasons, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going, I'm going to uh, create a directory. I'm going to clone a Git repository containing Git, um, you know, uh, property files in this Git repository, assuming the page loads. Uh, and we're going to clone this to my local machine. Here we are. Git clone desktop config. Oh, it's already there. Good. So I've got one here. It's a prop. It's a bunch of property files. I'm going to point that. I'm going to create a new config server to manage access, to mediate access to that directory full of configuration. And uh, we'll say that this is going to be a config service. Config server. We'll hit generate. That's going to generate a new project uh, in the download directory. So I'll open it up here. Come on. All right. Moving on. Okay. So now, in order for this to work, we need to do a little bit of coding here. 
I'm going to say at enable config server. All right, that was hard. And I need to specify what port on which port I want this to run. And I need to tell it where to find the directory full of configuration, which, as we know, lives uh, on the desktop, home desktop config. All right. So there's my my configuration to make this config server. It itself is going to act as an intermediary between other microservices and their configuration files, each of which is named uh, for the uh, the microservice. So you see, I've got desktop config, uh, you know, reservation hyphen service dot properties, for example. I'm going to name that microservice that we just built the reservation hyphen service and teach it to draw its configuration not from this property file that's built into the code base, but from this microservice that it's going to connect to using the Spring Cloud Starter Config client. All right, So this client is going to give us the ability to centralize our configuration. Et voila. Okay? We, uh, there's our uh, reservation service application. Now let's suppose I take advantage of this microservice that we've just stood up, localhost uh, 8888, reservation service default. You can see there's a, a property file. There's a property a message from, from where I was about 12 hours ago, right? I was I wasn't I wasn't here 12 hours ago. I was it was in Dubai, and so this message, while it's interesting, is completely wrong. It's the wrong message. We're not there at all. So I'm going to go ahead and connect my microservice to the set of configuration, but we'll update it, and uh, we'll we'll see that we have to change that message. Let's create a new endpoint here, called message. Okay, message, rec, server response dot okay dot body flux dot just, and I'm going to inject that message here from the config server. Here we are. I'll use the environment there. I'll say e .get property message, and I'll say string.class, all right? Whoops, wrong layer. Okay, there we are. Is that right? Thank you. There we are. So there's my new endpoint that I've just added to the application. It's called message. Now let's see what happens when I call that endpoint. Oops, I need a compiler to do the thing it's supposed to do. Okay, good. Localhost 8000 message. Remember the config server here says server port is equal to 8000. So it's now at 8000 in message. There's the, there's the value. It's the wrong it's the wrong value. We know that. I know that. Even I know that, right? So I'm going to go to the desktop here, config emacs reservation service properties. Yeah, it's me. It's me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say hello Bangalore extra exclamation mark so as to reinforce my credentials, authority, and authenticity in Reddit. Okay, git commit minus a minus m YOLO. Now, I'm going to send an empty HTTP post to another actuator op, you know, operational endpoint in this service called refresh. And the empty, empty HTTP post is going to be of content type application JSON. Ready, steady, go, refresh. So as soon as I did that, it instantly updated the configuration live. This supports things like feature flags. I can now you know, do canary deploys. I can do all sorts of nice things with this. Another thing that I care about in a distributed system is making it easy for one service to find and work with another. And to support this, I'm going to use a service registry. We could use DNS, but service registration discovery gives us the ability to programmatically interrogate the state of the system to ask, is that service there, not just where does that service live? And this is an important distinction, especially in a cloud-native system where things are going to come and go based on demand and capacity. So while there's a lot of options here that we could use in the Spring ecosystem, we could use Apache Zookeeper or HashiCorp Console or uh, uh, etcd or CloudFoundry itself. I mean, lots of different options here. I'm going to use Eureka for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, it's been used by Netflix. It was created by Netflix, uh, and it's been used by them for years and years at great scale, so we know it's going to do a good job or at least an okay job, and also it's an easy thing to stand up and demo. So that's great for people like me who are uh, particularly lazy and pressed for time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, now bring in the discovery client support. This is the common uniform interface that we need to be able to talk to that service registry. Right? So there it is. There I'm going to bring in Spring Cloud Startup, you know, Netflix Eureka client, and uh, we'll just start this application up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a service that talks to that service. I'm going to build another client that talks to that service called the reservation hyphen client. Config client, Eureka discovery, gateway, uh, Hystrix circuit breaker, we're going to bring, bring in reactive web, reactive, uh, we're going to use Lumbuck, we're going to use um, Redis, we we'll use uh, uh, security, spring security. Uh, I think that's enough. Eureka config client, do I have that? Yeah. Zipkin distributed tracing, good. We've got a number of things here, good. So I'm going to open this up here, and this is going to be an edge service. It's going to be a thing that other services will call. It'll be the first port of call. It'll be, it'll be clients that call it, you know, iPhones, Playstations, Xboxes, etc. This will be the first port of call for requests coming in from the outside world that need to be adapted to the downstream services, or, or that rather need to adapt requests 
to the downstream services uh, to homogenize them. So this is going to be our, uh, our first port of call for those kinds of uh, outside requests. Uh, it will, of course, be exposed via DNS, but it'll use uh, uh, the service registry to resolve all other services within the cluster, within the system. So we're going to say reservation hyphen client. And I'm going to comment out some of the bits I don't need just yet, like the security support here. Uh, so Spring Cloud, Spring Boot Starter Security, we don't need that just yet. Uh, and we're going to start up the code. And well, think about these common use cases, right? Uh, imagine you have an HTML5 client. HTML5 clients are very powerful, but they live in a sandbox that precludes them from making cross-origin requests. So we're going to use a gateway project, Spring Cloud Gateway. It's an API gateway to proxy requests from the outside to the downstream service. Let's do that here. We'll create a simple route locator. Okay, route locator, routes, or gateway, we can call it even, right? And uh, we're going to inject the builder DSL here, route locator builder. I'm going to say RLB dot routes dot uh, build, and then the route that we're going to build, the, the, the predicate for the route is um, this. We're going to say when a re request comes in at the local host node, on this node, this service is going to run in port 9999. When it comes to the uh, path called, uh, uh, you know, proxy, for example, then I want to uh, send it to this URL, right? HTTP spring spring that IO colon 80 forward slash guides. I'm going to proxy the data just to demonstrate what we can do here, right? So I'm using the builder DSL here to build a simple uh, gateway, a simple proxy example, okay? So this is, I could be more, uh, I could do all sorts of other interesting things here. I could say and, uh, you know, and host equals dot foo.com, for example, right? I can do all sorts of interesting things at the gateway predicate layer here, but uh, for our purposes, it suffices to leave it at that. So localhost 9999 forward slash proxy. Now, this is going to call the spring.io website and download the, the output and, re and render that there in the client. So this is great. This is a, a third-party website. It's not the one we want, but it does demonstrate what is capable here, right? Now, let's instead delegate or forward the request to a load-balanced call to our service, the service we just stood up that is now visible in the service registry, right? I could, I set the path there before. I set the path, the context path like this before, but you can also do that in a filter. And the filter is really where you get a lot of the power in the gateway project. You can do rate limiting, you can add request headers, you can uh, change request headers, you can use a circuit breaker, you can do redirects, you can do, uh, you know, we can remove things, you can retry calls, you can save sessions, do secure things like that. Um, or in this case, you can just set the path, right? Like so, I'm gonna set the path on the target call. Uh, and then we're going to see what happens. So now, remember, I started up that service registry. That service registry is on port 87, 8761. You can see that right now there's this reservation service. It's in the registry. That's the service that's visible. It's now, oh yeah. Very good. That service is now visible for clients that are making calls. Uh, and we're going to use that client, you know, we're going to use that service registry to find uh, the service and then use it from the reservation client. And that's what I've done here. I've got this URL that is load balance. This isn't DNS. This is actually the service ID in the registry itself. So I'm going to make that call now. If I go to proxy. You can see that when I go to proxy now, it goes directly to the services instances in the registry. It picks one using a client-side load balancer. By default, it's LRU or least recently used, but you can do data center aware load balancing or multi-tenancy or OAuth aware token you know, session affinity or whatever you want. Lots of good strategies there. Now, if you have a different client that is, um, if you have a, if you have a, a client that needs a particular view of the data, as opposed to this cross-cutting sort of generic proxy that applies to all services and all endpoints, you can create a, a semantic endpoint here, right? You can say, I'm going to create a, uh, a uh, an endpoint that has a particular view that is adapted uh, for the, um, I, I've adapted it uh, to the requirements of a client. Maybe I want to have a, just an endpoint that shows only the, the names, not the whole JSON structure, not the attributes, not the ID, just the names, right? So I'm going to create a new endpoint here. This is an API adapter. It's not, a, it's not an API gateway. It's a slightly different thing, uh, but they both serve the goal of supporting a client. Okay, so now when somebody goes to reservations, names, they're going to get this handler function. And this handler function is going to be, you know, we're going to create another endpoint here, server response dot ok dot body. And I'm going to have to make an HTTP call, aren't I? I'm going to have to make an HTTP call just like I did, uh, just like you would to be able to do any kind of HTTP call. So I'm going to use the reactive web client, right? This web client is an HTTP client that you can use that is very efficient uh, when it makes calls to other services. Now I'm going to create an instance of this client, and the reason I'm going to do that is because uh, I need to configure a filter. And this filter is going to be aware of our load balancer, of the uh, of the client-side load balancer, and of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the 
load balancer strategy that we've got there. So I'm going to inject that here in creating this bean and creating this object. I'm going to bend that instance there. Okay. So now I've injected this into the the uh, the handler, the, the you know the route route code there, and uh, I'm going to call uh, that endpoint. I'm going to call dot get URI will be HTTP colon forward slash forward slash reservation hyphen service. Again, this isn't DNS. I'm making an HTTP call to the downstream service. I'm going to take the body and I'm going to turn it into a publisher of type reservation. But I don't have this type on the class path, do I? So I'm going to do something terrible here, friends. Something that you should never, ever do. Not even when you're all by yourself alone at home and nobody's looking. I'm going to copy and paste some code. So I'm going to go here. Copy and paste. Paste. Oh, that's awful. The worst feeling. Because you know it's going to come back and haunt you later on. So don't even do it. I'm doing it for a demo, and I feel bad about it. All right. So we have a publisher of type reservation. I want to map each reservation to its reservation name and store the whole thing into a publisher of, you know, a publisher of strings, you know, the, the names. So there we are. That's the response that I'm going to send uh, in, this, in this publisher, uh, and it'll be of type string. And that's fine. Now, this code will actually work in the 80% case. Uh, if there are one or more instances of this service in the registry, it's going to do the right thing. But what if I have uh, zero instances of that service in the registry? How can I load balance across zero instances? It's a bit like dividing by zero, isn't it? What happens when you divide by zero? Hey, Siri. What is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies, and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. It's true. Don't make Cookie Monster sad. High-performing organizations understand that eventually, statistically, as you scale out, something is going to fail. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we need to be prepared for that. So while this is working, right, I can go to reservation names, for example, and I get all the names back, uh, you know, kind of mushed together there, but there's all the names. That's working. It doesn't uh, prepare for the eventuality that something is going to go wrong. If you have a, a cloud platform like Cloud Foundry, it'll make sure that if a service falls down and you want it to come back online, it'll get restarted automatically. But in the meantime, we need to build our code accordingly. We need to uh, uh, prepare for something like this to happen using, for example, a circuit breaker. So I'm going to build a circuit breaker using Hystrix. Hystrix is a, a library from Netflix. I'm going to adapt this publisher. I'm going to build it. Uh, I'm going to provide a fallback behavior. I'll say, whenever something goes wrong, just call this publisher that returns a string called eek, right? Uh, and uh, we'll give it a fallback name, a command name. So names, there we are. And I'm going to use that circuit breaker publisher instead of the actual publisher. And that way I'll have a little bit of indirection that'll, that'll you know, uh, uh, give me a useful response. High performing websites do this kind of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, well, you went to the search engine service, but it's not available right now. Here are some machine learning recommendations from across the web, for example, right? So here we are. This is fine. Good, 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 good. Now I go down to the uh, uh, other service, kill that, and you can see I get eek instead of a big fat 500 error or stack trace or something like that. Okay. Now, thus far, my friends, we have uh, we've looked at a number of different things here. Uh, we should also be taking care of observability. I looked at observability in the very beginning. I talked about it in terms of the actuator as a way to observe individual instances, but that ignores the larger system, the whole system. If I am walking here in beautiful Bangalore, is that equivalent, is that functionally equivalent to uh, looking at the Google map for Bangalore? I think not. Of course not, right? One is not the same as the other. One is far more vivid. There's so much more traffic and so much more amazing food and wonderful people here in Bangalore that I could hope to appreciate by looking at the Google map. The map is not the terrain, and the same is true for your production system. Your architecture diagram is not the same as your production system. And if you want to appreciate the whole system, you need to observe that system. One way to do that is to use distributed tracing. So thus far, on my in the class path of my applications, I've got this thing called Zipkin, Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. This is a distributed tracing tool uh, that's already on the class path, and it's already publishing uh, trace information about our application to localhost 9411. And it's doing so using Kafka. I've got Kafka running in the background there. Uh, and so here you can see it says I've got two services, reservation client, reservation service. If I click on this, I can see that you know I've got this endpoint here to uh, uh, the reservations endpoint. I can see reservation names. I can hit find trace, and it shows me all these requests that have happened two minutes ago, whatever you know, a minute ago. I click on that and I get the details. It says oh reservation client, reservation names. Uh, it, a few milliseconds later, eight milliseconds later, it went to the reservation service. I click on that, I get the request log, the in and out, etc. Right? This gives me visibility into what 
the system as a whole is doing. I can understand the, the system. It makes it much easier to debug, right? Because remember, when you move to microservices, things get distributed, right? So you, it's good to have a single pane of glass to understand the whole system. All right, my friends. Well, I, uh, I feel like we're out of time. I feel like we've kind of come to a, uh, a useful stopping point. I wish we had more time. If we had more time, we'd talk about federated security and single sign-on using Spring Cloud Security. If we, if we had more time, we'd talk about leadership election and demotion using Spring Integration and Spring Cloud Cluster. If we had more time, we'd talk about eventual consistency in the Saga pattern using Spring uh, Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Dataflow. If we had more time, we'd talk about testing with consumer-driven contracts and consumer-driven contract testing. If we had more time, we'd talk about any number of things beyond what we've talked about today. But I'm afraid, my friends, that we're just plumb out of time. I hope you liked some of what we talked about here today. We covered just a few things. We looked at how to build REST APIs in a reactive way. We looked at reactive persistence using MongoDB and Spring data and, and you know Spring, uh, Spring support for reactive uh, programming. We looked at how to use centralized configuration. We looked at service registration and discovery, client-side load balancing, API gateways. Uh, uh, we talked about a number of opportunities there, including rate limiting and uh, proxying. We looked at uh, how to build semantic sort of API adapters. We used the reactive web client. We did uh, client-side load balancing there as well. We looked at how to integrate uh, reliability patterns like a circuit breaker, and if we had more time, we would have certainly talked about messaging as a way of doing writes where we just did reads with the, uh, the web client. And uh, we also looked at observability ever so briefly using uh, Zipkin, a, a distributed tracing platform from Twitter that is neatly integrated into Spring Cloud and into Spring Boot. We have only begun, to scratch, only begun to scratch the surface, though. I hope you liked some of it. Did any of you learn about something you liked here? Uh, or see something that you could use at some point. I'm glad to hear that. Very glad to hear that, of course. Uh, but, you know, I obviously am a big fan. Obviously, I've got the t-shirt and the spring underwear. Obviously, I'm a fan, right? But you don't have to take my word for it. I love this stuff. But there's lots of all, lots of small uh, organizations out there that are doing amazing things as well. There's uh, Netflix. They're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, and if you think about uh, Amazon.com, Amazon.com is the Alibaba of the far, 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 far extreme west. Okay? Now, Rakuten.com in Japan is the Alibaba of the far, far extreme east. Uh, they're an e-commerce engine. They're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry. Uh, Alibaba itself is using Spring Boot and Spring and Spring Cloud uh, for everything. I mean, Aliyun, Aliba, Alibaba, Pay, uh, How, uh, Taobao, uh, Alipay, uh, AliExpress, all this is all Spring and Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Uh, Baidu, a search engine, the third largest in the world, they're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry as well. So these organizations, Yahoo Japan, is using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry. These organizations, and many of those besides, are building amazing software, and they have to get to production faster. They have the money, the motivation, and the means to solve these problems themselves, but they choose instead to build on the Pivotal stack because it, allow, because it allows them, to, as, a, as an organization, to deliver better software faster to the customer, which, at the end of the day, is all that matters. So thank you so much, my friends. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach me outside. I'll talk. Thank you.